Tomato's house, Fort Worth family. Listen, my name is Phil Galindo. Y yo soy Monica Huerta. And we're so excited that you joined us this morning. Listen, we are in for a treat today. You know why? Because today we're celebrating Cinco de Mayo. Cinco right? de Mayo. May 5th. And listen, before we get go any further, this is what I want you to do real quick. We're going to have some announcements that are going to be scrolling across the screen. And what I want you to do is take a screenshot because we want you to stay connected, all right? So do that for us. Stay connected because it's going to be amazing. Y para todos aquellos de habla hispana, mm -hmm. vamos a estar presentando en tu pantalla todos los eventos que habrá y que estarán ocurriendo durante este mes. Así que captúralos en tu teléfono para que lo pongas en tu calendario porque hoy estamos celebrando 5 de mayo. Y ahorita regresamos. Sister serve a lot. That's what I said. She always trying to correct me and everything. And, and, and see, this is just the whole, you gonna have a whole lot of stuff. You gotta teach me about this interpretation things and all of that. Um, I've been interpreting for a long time um, now. And, and so Monica, uh, Cinco de Mayo? Cinco, Cinco de Mayo. That's what I said. Uh, what, is, what is that? Well, it's the celebration of victory. Oh my God! Hallelujah! We celebrate victory. Then. Thank you. <laughs> yes, hallelujah. Who 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 is celebrating? What? Well, it's a Mexican heritage ah. celebration, and it was. That's you. Yes, that's oh, me. Wow. That's me. Well, glory. Yes. Aha. And happy celebration, I guess. Then Cinco de Mayo to everybody of Mexican descent. This is great. But. Uh -huh. But the reason why we celebrate it here uh -huh. in the United States, do you want to know that? Yes. It's because. When we were fighting, mm -hmm. the United States was also fighting, and the first time that Cinco de Mayo was celebrated was in Southern California in May 1863. Wait a minute, now, now when was this? What, what, is Cinco, what day is Cinco de Mayo? What day? Cinco yeah. de Mayo? Yeah. What do you mean, what day? What's the date? Cinco de Mayo is May 5th. Okay, May 5th. That <laughs> means we don't celebrate May 5th. Make sure. Everybody is celebrating that day. Now, 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 Monica, what does it mean to you? I mean, it means that we are courageous, uh -huh. that whenever we unite and we fight together, we obtain the victory. Uh -huh. Anything. That's like prayer. That sounds That's like, like prayer. prayer. When yes. we fight together, we win together. Like two or three gather together. Oh, glory! Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Two or three, the Bible says, two or three gather together in his name and says, touching and agree. We don't do a 
whole lot of touching though right now because of the pan- <laughs> pandemic and caring and, and everything. But, uh, and I got my social distance test. I mean, my cold, my caring, my caring test. But, and everything. So, I'm all right. And I got the two shots. Yes. But how y'all say that? Dos? Dos? Dos. Va- vacunas. Va- vacunas. 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 Uh-huh. Dos vacunas. <laughs> we got two of those. I got two. And everything is good now. But I still wear my mask. You know, stay social distance and everything. Anyway, uh, I hope y'all learned a lot about Cinco de Mayo, because I did, and this is just wonderful. We celebrating and, and everything the freedom. Well, yes. we got to go. See y'all later. Bye-bye. Welcome back, family. Now, now, Miss Monica, I heard that you just had an encounter with none other than Sister Servala. Now, let me tell you about my experience. You know, we were having a, a, a youth event, and uh, she said tortilla, and I was trying to correct her, like, nicely, you know, because that's what we do. You know, nicely, it's tortilla, but she was like, no, it's tortilla, and then, you know, it's, so I wasn't going to argue with her, but she told me my hair was going to turn green, and it was going to fall out, and, you know, and I repented and asked her for forgiveness. So, how was your experience? Well, apparently everything's about food, because mm. she said tortilla, and when we were talking about Cinco de Mayo, she said Cinco de Mayo. So, I guess she was hungry and wanted to eat a sandwich. Yeah, which makes sense. Mm. Pero ahora los queremos invitar que en cualquier momento del servicio vamos a tener a nuestros ministros esperando por ti para oración, preguntas, si quieres entregar tu vida a Cristo. La información está aquí en la pantalla, así que te esperamos. So what she said was, our ministers and elders are here to serve you. So at any point in the service, please go to the Zoom room. They're there to pray for you if you uh, want prayer or if you want to give your life to Christ. You can go and they're there to serve you at any point in service. We got to go because it's time for service. Are you ready for service? Yes, let's go. Let's go. Mayo. Cinco de Mayo celebration of Mexican heritage. It commemorates the Mexican army's victory over France at the Battle of Puebla on May 5th, 1862. Cinco de Mayo was first celebrated in the United States in Southern California in 1863 as a show of solidarity with Mexico against French rule. Cinco de Mayo marks unlikely defeat of elite French forces by an undermanned Mexican army in the Battle of Puebla. This underdog Mexican victory may have played a part in preventing French Emperor Napoleon III from helping the Confederacy win the American Civil War. The victory represented a significant morale boost 
to the Mexican military and the Mexican people at large. It helped establish a sense of national unity with the United States of America. Cinco de Mayo commemorates freedom and democracy for all. Good morning, family. What an amazing day to celebrate our glorious God with the glorious praise. Would you stand up in your home and just clap your hands? We're going to sing an old song, but I think it fits what we're celebrating today. So everybody clap. Come on, come on. Hey, say it. When you come, say When you come to his presence, lifting up the name of Jesus. And you hear the people. And you see the people. Just forget. Just forget about your worries. Let your troubles fall behind you. Don't you wait. Here we go. that says that we were created to make his praise glorious. 
look at somebody in the house and say that I was created to give him praise. I was created to give him glory. I was created to give him worship. Hallelujah. Father, we submit that you are great. You are mighty and you're worthy of all glorious praise this morning. You're everything we need. We're nothing without you. You are everything. Yeah. Say, oh, yeah. Lord, you are, say, Lord, you are, you are the bright and morning star, you are to me, Alpha, Omega, Alpha, Omega. You, are my you are my favorite, you are everything Come on, let's do the verse. Hungry, God. You are 
worship him right there. The God that does all things well. Come on. If you know he's everything, if you know in him you live, you move, and have your being, if you know if he's for you, he's more than the world against you, won't you wave your hands and just give him worship right there? Everybody, one more time, say it. Say, you are everything. You are everything. 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 You are everything. You are everything. You are. You are. I submit to you today. You are everything. I submit to you today. Everything. You are everything. You are everything. You are. You are. You know your mind is cramped when you revert back to what you used to do because you don't know what to do. Oh God, have you ever been in a time in your life in which you don't know what to do? And so now you go back to doing what you used to do because you don't know what to do because your mind is cramped up. There was no creativity coming. There was no thought coming. There was no thought for the future coming. There was nothing that's coming because all of you're dealing with is all of your pain, all of your hurt, all of your guilt, all of your frustration. You're dealing with all of it and it has cramped your mind where you cannot function. You cannot operate. You cannot create. You cannot think. You cannot move. And the only thing that you can do to keep yourself from Doing something even more crazy is to go back to doing what you used to do. You'll be surprised at how many people cramped up this year. You'll be surprised at how many people cramped up. Some went back to some of the things that they were doing before they met Christ. Some, some, some people went back, went back, just reverted back. And, 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 and sometimes it happens, it happens, it happens because the mind cramps up. Good morning, family. Get ready to reset your mind for our announcements. What's going on, teenagers? I can tell you what's going on. You guys are small groups at 9 o'clock a.m. That's what's going on. Make sure you guys are notified and know about Teenager Small Groups on this Monday at 9 a.m. You'll see the Zoom information on the screen. Family, financial literacy is so important for us to know about, and it is so vital that we take advantage of the financial resources we have at our fingertips. United Megacare and BBVA are hosting a financial ed workshop on May 13th at 7 p.m. on credit scores and reports. They are teaching you how to make your money work for you and your family. So make sure you register today. Visit our website and click the graphic on our community resource pages to register. Well, family, I hope you guys are getting ready for the resetting of your mind. I hope you enjoyed our announcements. Hello, family. Pastor Winfield here. Man, and I want to invite you to this very special moment, the giving moment. See, oftentimes we think that in the context of church and ministry and worship, that when it's time to give, that it is a break from the worship. And, and that statement could be no further from the truth. The reality of it is that every time that you do give, it is an act of worship. I want you to see that when God speaks to Abraham and says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go to the mountain and I want you to worship me and I want you to sacrifice your son. Isaac. He used sacrifice within the context of worship and used it in such a way that even while they were on their way to the top of the mountain, Abraham, in having a conversation with Isaac, Isaac says, Father, I know we're going up top to worship and I see the fire and I see the knife, but where is the sacrifice? Where is the sacrifice when you are in the context of worship. Where is the sacrifice when you are ascending to a higher place and you have nothing to give? See, even Isaac knew and understood that there is no sacrifice if there is no worship. And there is no worship if there is no sacrifice. So now the two are synonymous with each other. So whenever we are talking about worshiping the Lord, we're actually talking about bringing a sacrifice to the Lord. 
Now, I know that for many of us, it may mean sacrifice of praise, and that's good, and that's wonderful, and that's cute, and all that stuff, especially when you want to step away from the responsibility of actually giving something that is a little bit more substantial. But when I talk about giving, when I talk about sacrifice within the context of your worship, I'm talking about giving something that is attached to your faith, something that you can say by faith that, Lord, I sacrifice this to you, because I know that you will provide for me. This is the mindset that you go into whenever you are giving. So I need for you to do me a favor. I want you to get your tithe and your offering together, whatever the Lord is placing in your heart to sacrifice, because we're going to be like Abraham and we're going to offer up that which we love as a sacrifice. We're going to be uh, like Abraham and so into a King Nuk. Chizedek, the king of Salem, the king of peace and righteousness. We're going we're gonna to give into the king's house. We're going to be like that woman with the alabaster bottle that comes in and breaks it open and washes and, and purifies Jesus' body in preparing, in preparing his body for the burial, and which the disciples would call it waste. Jesus calls it worship. I'm, I, we're going to be like them, the people of the Bible. We're going to be like that widow's mite that gave of her, of her last versus the Pharisee who gave a portion of his plenty. And we're going to sacrifice to the Lord and worship the Lord in the context of our giving and our giving within the context of our sacrifice. Oh, man, we're about to have a worship moment, and then we're going to come back, and I'm going to pray over your tithe and your offerings. I want you to get them ready. Get ready because we're about to sacrifice. So this month, as we're, as, we're, as we're resetting our minds, as we're resetting our minds, I want to make a conscious decision this morning, and I want you to make a conscious decision, decision that you will worship the Lord regardless of what's going on around you, regardless of your circumstances. We make the decision this morning that we will worship, we will not be silent, we will always worship as we reset our minds. That's our declaration today. Say, and I will say, and I will not. As long as, as long as. 
Wow, wasn't that worship refreshing? See, every time we come together to worship the Lord, it does something collectively when we come and magnify the Lord together. Now, if our worship is just that prolific, I wonder what our sacrifice will be when we come together and we give to the Lord together and we sacrifice together. We tap into a whole nother dimension of God's grace and God's favor when we do it, not just individually, but we do it collectively as a body. So I want you to get your tithe and offering together, man. And if you've been tithing or uh, through our app, I want you to, to text P T P H F W T P H F W to 77977. Text T P H F W to 77977. And I want you to give. I want you to give faithfully. And I want you to give <laughs> at, like God is your provider because I know that he is. Come on. I want us to... Uh, to worship the Lord in giving. I wanna pray over your seed and pray over your sacrifice right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this moment and the time and the opportunity that you give to us to sacrifice to you. Now, Lord, it is our, our worship experience. It is our act of worship, oh God, that we give and we sacrifice on the level that you have blessed us on and on the level that we love you on. So I pray that your favor supernaturally will come back on those who are willing to sacrifice even in this moment, those who are willing to give. I pray, oh God, that you would bless them supernaturally with your uncommon favor. And I pray that their faith, that their families, that their finances and their future will be blessed. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. All right, family. <laughs> Let's give right now, and let's continue in worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to all have the same kind of mind and reasoning that we should be rejoicing and being glad in it because everybody didn't see this day. There are hundreds of people around this world that will not see the dawn of this new day. But yet and still, God has allowed through your time and my time to roll on a little while longer so that we can see the dawning of a brand new day. And even while the sun was breaking the, the continuity of the darkness and light was shining in, causing for that which was hidden in darkness to become manifested in the light. And while our faces and our heads were 
were nestled neatly against the softness of our pillows. God was still preparing all the things that you were going to receive this day just for you. And so now this is a prayer that, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> give us this day our daily bread because there's something that God has in store for you with your name on it. I'm so excited that God gives us the opportunity to do that. Now, I want you to gather the family around and we're going to pray in just a moment. I just want to rehearse just a couple of announcements uh, in your hearing just so that you can understand what's happening and what's going on right here at the Potter's House of Fort Worth. First thing I want everybody to know is that on Pentecost Sunday, that's right, May the 23rd, we are going to have a live service right here at the Potter's House of Fort Worth. Now, I want you to know and understand that while we are having that live service, that we are going to register people. That's right. We're going to register, so I need for you to still register. Uh, we're going to have the live service in person, but I need for you to register. I need for you to go to our website at tphfw.org and register for that Pentecost service. Now, those of you who don't know, we are in a season of expectation. Why? Because now Passover is not just a day, it's a season. No more than Pentecost is a day, but it is a season. It is a season between Passover and Pentecost where we journey with God and the power of the Holy Spirit as to the growth and the development of his disciples, such as to be empowered to do the work that God called them out to do. That's right. I am believing God that God is going to set the trajectory of your life towards a place of purpose and fulfillment so that whatever you have been doing in these times past, whatever has grown stale, whatever has grown frustrated to you, whatever has grown uh, into more of a consternation than a compliment for you, then I want to pray that God will do something, shift some things around so that you can step into your place of fulfillment and totally be empowered by the Spirit of God. I believe that on the day of Pentecost, when we come in here, it's going to be powerful it's going to be filled with the presence of God and I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to visit us like never before so you need to sign up register be a part of that go to our website at tphfw.org it's going to be off the chain it's going to be as the young folks say lit I'm gonna do this just for my sons I want to embarrass them just for a second I don't know what that what kind of dance that is but I'm doing the dance cuz that's my way of saying I am Joshua and Caleb and Chris's dad. All right, there it is. All right, so it's going to be powerful. Gather the family around. Let's pray. Make sure you rest. <laughs> ah, a little levity doesn't hurt anybody. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the power of your Holy Spirit, all the work that you have called us to do in this moment, all the things that you've called us to hear and to obey in this moment. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that your word would emanate your word, Father, would rise up within us. That it would be delivered and presented in such a way that your people can receive it. And that they would receive it on the level, Father, that it is given. I pray, Father, for the power of the Holy Spirit. Lead us and guide us. I pray that you would think through my thoughts and speak through my words and help me to articulate with passion and grace the things that are on your heart and on your mind in the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, that you would release strength and power and vitality to my brother and to my sister, that even after this moment of receiving your word, that something would break in their life, break into a new day, break into a new dawn, break into a new season of fulfillment for them according to your grace, according to your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. All right, family, I want to read for you uh, the book of John, the 21st chapter. The book of John, the 21st chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 19. Now, I know that that's a lot of verses, but I want, you to, I want you to hear it and read it. Not that it is just a bunch of literature and a bunch of words and nouns and verbs and prepositions and direct objects, objects and objects and conjunctions and punctuations put together such as to make it easy to read. I want you to read it as if the Holy Spirit is speaking to us through this text, through this narrative, because he is today. 
And I want you to read it like you have never read it before. I want you to read it like it is fresh to you. I want you to read it like, like man, that this is something that God really wants to speak to you, that if you don't get everything from this text that God is speaking and teaching you today, that it's going to be a detriment to the future of your life. And so that's the way that I want you to read. So let's go into the text as if we have never heard this text or read this text before. All of you who have been in church and in Christianism all your life, you have read it and you have, have heard it preached before, but act like you haven't. And uh, all the rest of you who this is maybe your first time reading it and, and, and hearing it on this level, then I want you to receive new manna and fresh manna from the Lord. The book of John, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 19. John, 21st chapter, verses 1 through 19. Listen to what it says. It says, Jesus, after these things, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, who was called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are also coming with you. They went out, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. And yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish to eat, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find the fish. So they cast it him. Then they were not able to haul it in because of the great quantity of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they, for they were uh, not far from the land, but about 200 cubits away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out of the land... Out, out on the land, excuse me, they saw a charcoal fire already made and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. So Simon Peter went up and hauled the net to land full of large fish, 153 to be exact. And although there were so many, the net was not Oh, God. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to inquire of him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. So Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. And this was now the third time that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15, now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend to my lambs. He said to him again, a, a, a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. Our times are in hand. Verse 18, truly, truly, I tell you that when you were younger, you used to put on your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will put your belt on you and bring you where you do not want to go. 
Now he said this, indicated by what kind of death he would glorify God, that being Peter. And when he had said this, he said to them, or said to him, follow me. Follow me. I want to talk to you uh, from, from this thought today. Uh, for the month of April, we talked about resetting our faith. But for the month of May, I want to talk from this theme, resetting the mind. Resetting the mind. And today, I want to talk just from one word, just from that overall thematic thrust for this month of resetting the mind. I want to talk about cramping. Cramping. Uh, I.e., cramped. Okay. I want, you to, I want you to type that out. Cramped. Cramped. <sighs> I believe it was 2014. The Miami Heat is playing against the San Antonio Spurs. In the finals, the first game was in San Antonio, and the gym was hot. Over 96 degrees in the gym, while these world class athletes dribbling the ball and running up and down the court, playing hard because they want to win the championship. While they are playing, towards the third and the fourth quarter, the main player on the Miami Heat at the time, by the name of LeBron James, starts cramping up. And each time, periodically, that he cramps up, he cannot move the leg. They have to call a timeout and bring him over to the side, put liquids in him, put him back in the game. And he does another move and he cramps up again. And while there's a stopping and a starting again for LeBron and for the rest of the Miami, Miami Heat team, San Antonio is functioning on all cylinders. Nobody is cramping. Everybody is healthy. Well, suffice it to say that that year, the San Antonio Spurs went on to win the NBA championship. And they were not supposed to because the previous year, it was the Miami Heat that beat them. After all, they had the big three, which was considered, or who was considered LeBron James and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh and Ray Allen. They had all of these players, but yet and still they could not secure another championship win against the San Antonio Spurs. And for the Spurs, everything turned out okay. Because after all, in the midst of this hot, humid gym, in the midst of all of these crazy circumstances, their bodies functioned just fine. It was the main star, the one in whom a lot of young people in this generation would call the goat. It was his body that cramped up. And as a result of that cramping, they were not able to win. Cramping is something that is very interesting. It, it, it hinders you from actually functioning at the highest level of your capacity. But what I, what I want to suggest to you is that it's very possible for your mind to cramp up too. Let me explain. What is the mind? I'm glad you asked the question. See, the mind can be defined as a person's set of intellectual or mental faculties and refers to the group of cognitive psychiatric processes and skills that we use every day. It is the doing of the brain's being. It is, it is earmarked by certain skills and functions of the brain, five to be example. First one is called coordination. Coordination is the skill that makes it possible to move efficiently and precisely and is responsible for efficiently interacting with our environment. Coordination gives you better movement. Reasoning. 
It's a, an executive function, but, but reasoning, reasoning is, is, the, is the thought and the idea that it makes it possible to relate the information that we perceive with the information that we have stored, which helps hypothesize and resolve problems that arise in our daily life. Reasoning. Attention. Attention is the ability to choose and concentrate on relevant stimuli, and attention is the cognitive process that makes it possible to position ourselves towards relevant stimuli and consequently respond to it. Hopefully you're writing these down. First one was coordination. The second one was reasoning. This third one is attention. Write that down. C, R, A, C, coordination, R, reasoning, A, attention. Here is your M, M, memory. Memory is the brain's ability to retain information and voluntarily recover it when needed and, when, and what makes it possible to remember facts, ideas, feelings, and relationships between concepts. And last one is perception. See, perception is the ability to capture processes and actively make sense of the information that our senses receive. It is the cognitive process that makes it possible to interpret our surroundings. See, all together, in order for us to remember the functionality of the brain, it spells cramp. <laughs> yeah, cramp. C is coordination. R is reasoning. A is attention. M is memory. P is perception. And all of it together is cramp. That's right. That's right, just like LeBron could not finish those particular games because he was cramping up, it is very possible for your mind to cramp up to the point where your life is stalled. Because cramping is a painful involuntary interaction of a muscle or muscles and typically it's caused by fatigue or strain. It's very possible that for a whole year you have been fatigued and strained with living in a pandemic and your mind it's cramped up. It could, it could as a verb, be restrict or inhibit the development, the future development of your mind as it pertains to creativity or other things because your mind has cramped up. It's very possible for you to be doing something and you lose all creativity because your mind has cramped up because you're fatigued and you're tired and or you're worried or you have anxiety or you have fear or you have insecurity or you have an idiosyncrasy or you have a mistake or a failure that you're stuck in. It's very possible for your mind to cramp up on you. Have you ever been in uh, taking a test and you studied very hard for the test and you got in there and you was about to take that test, man, and you were on point. You knew your stuff and then you start taking the test and reading the questions and your mind cramped up on you, wasn't able to perform, wasn't able to memorize or, or to, to remember, wasn't able to pay attention, wasn't able to coordinate. Have you ever got to the place in which your mind cramped up on you because you were taking tests? Have you ever got to the place in which you were uh, in an interview possibly and, and while you are interviewing, here is, are you ready for this interview? You, you studied the company, you know about the company, you know about their, their investments, you know about their, their revenue, the previous quarters, you know that what they do, what they sell, how they sell, their marketing, strategy, all that stuff, and you get in there all prepared, but then they ask you a question, and this one question locks up your whole mind. <laughs> the mind cramps up on you. Have you ever, have you ever done even the mon mundane thing in which, in which something is, is not working in your house, and so you call uh, the company to come out and fix it, and, and, and they come out and they ask you what seems to be the problem, and you can't even remember what the problem is? Or what the problem was, because your mind has cramped up on you. Have you ever gone from one room to the next room saying, I'm leaving this room so I can go and get something, and by the time you get to that other room, you can't remember why you left the previous room? Your mind cramped up on you. Have you ever got to the place in which you wanted to pray, but you got so tired and you were so fatigued? that you fell asleep instead of praying and your mind cramped up on you. It is very possible for your mind to cramp up 
on you. So now, we're in a very precarious situation, especially when we look at this text, because what we're looking at is a disciple who's Peter and the rest of the disciples who are following him because Peter is their leader, and he is cramping up. After all, Peter has endured great tragedy, the one in which he was supposed to follow these three years has been crucified, has died. He's, he went through a tragic death, and, 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 and Peter was there watching all of this happen, and he was there watching his Lord and Savior be beaten, and he was watching it and, and connecting with it and saying to himself, I left all to follow this man, and it is tragic because he attached his faith to something that was going through so much. And he died. But then he resurrected. And Peter endured the emotional stress that came from that whole death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I mean, we entered into the week of Passover with the celebration of Palm Sunday. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest, great. Great and wonderful is the one that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And we end the week with hiding in our rooms because we are afraid to be associated with him. We had no problem partying with him when everybody was praising him. But when he started going through, when he started going into his purpose for which he was birthed in, that is to die and to be crucified, then I detached myself from him and hid myself behind closed doors because I was afraid that they would do the same thing to me. Peter has endured great tragedy. He's endured great guilt because now Jesus is crucified, but then he resurrects on the third day, and the Bible declares that they, as he was on his way to the tomb, that Mary and, 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 the, and some of the women told him that, hey, Jesus' body is not there anymore, and John, John, the, the one who wrote the book, John, runs fast to the, to the tomb to see what happened to Jesus' body, and he's no longer there, and here is Peter now in the place of trying to understand what happened to the body of his Lord. He is going through the traumatic experience of thinking that somebody stole his Savior's body until they are behind closed doors and Jesus walks in while the doors were shut and he says, it is me. And he sits down, has fish with them, eats with them, and Peter is sitting there still traumatized by what he has experienced. Jesus leaves. Downing Thomas comes in and is, and then they're telling Thomas, hey, Jesus was just here. And Thomas is like, I will not believe it until I put my hand in his side. I will not believe it until I, I put my hand on his scars. And Jesus being now able to move at the speed of thought appears in the presence of his disciples again. And he says, Thomas, Handle me. He takes his hand. He puts it into his hand. He says, see, this is me. This is the holes in my hand. And he takes his, his hand and he thrusts it in the side. He said, no, see, it is me. See, that's the one that was thrusted in his side. And here I am still in your presence. And Thomas says, I believe. And then Jesus makes a declaration and says, blessed is he who believes and yet does not see. What a heavy statement, Lord. And then he disappears again. He's gone. No, no assignment, no nothing. Jesus, just a conversation, and then you're gone. Here I am again. I, I left everything to follow you, Lord, and here I am again. And this traumatic experience of not trying to figure out what am I going to do next? He's endured great tragedy. He denied Jesus three times and he knows it and he's got to deal with the guilt of that because he told everybody that he would not deny him. But yet and still, he denies him and he's dealing with the personal guilt because he's had a personal failure that everybody doesn't necessarily know about. But he knows about it and Jesus knows about it and he is dealing with that personal issue within his own head, within his own heart. And he is battling 
great doubt. Am I worthy enough? I know he called me before, but am I worthy enough? Do, or did Jesus make a mistake in calling me and telling me to follow him? Now, great uncertainty because he doesn't know what's next. <laughs> Have you ever spent any time of your life following God and ever endured great tragedy? Maybe, maybe this year has, has, has had you enduring great tragedy. Maybe somebody died. Maybe somebody that you love has passed. Maybe something happened in your life that's got you enduring great tragedy and you had great guilt because when it happened, you didn't act the same way that you should have acted and you didn't, you didn't, you wasn't filled with faith like everybody thought that you were. And maybe you wasn't the strong person that they thought that you were and, and maybe you gotten weak and maybe you had great doubt and they didn't know it. Uh, but yet and still, here you are suffering and suffering and dealing with your own stuff and now you're dealing with a great uncertainty because now you don't know how life is going to be in the future and your mind has cramped your emotions has cramped you don't know what to do and your mind has cramped up Peter Peter, what are you going to do? Peter says, my mind is cramped. I go a fishing. He, he goes back to do what he was doing before he was called. And what you got to understand is that you know your mind is cramped when you revert back to what you used to do because you don't know what to do. Oh God, have you ever been in a time in your life in which you don't know what to do? And so now you go back to doing what you used to do because you don't know what to do, because your mind is cramped up. There was no creativity coming. There was no thought coming. There was no thought for the future coming. There was nothing that's coming because all of you're dealing with is all of your pain, all of your hurt, all of your guilt, all of your frustration. You're dealing with all of it, and it has cramped your mind where you cannot function. You cannot operate. You cannot create. You cannot think. You cannot move. And the only thing that you can do to keep yourself from Doing something even more crazy is to go back to doing what you used to do. You'll be surprised at how many people cramped up this year. You'll be surprised at how many people cramped up. Some went back to some of the things that they were doing before they met Christ. Some, some, some people went back, went back, just reverted back. And, and, and sometimes it happens, it happens, it happens because the mind cramps. Number two, you know, your mind is cramped when you are sitting in a failing situation, seemingly just floating, but not succeeding. Peter says, I'm going fishing. Thomas, James, and some of the other disciples say, I'm going to go with you, Peter. They're sitting in the boat in total darkness, not catching anything. <laughs> Sitting there on the water, total darkness, not catching anything. And you would think that it would bother them that they're not catching anything, but I don't think that it was the fact that they wanted to catch something. I think it was the fact that they just wanted to get away from everything. And sometimes when your mind is cramped up, you just feel the need to get away from everything and to get away. And the only way that you can get away is to go away and do something that is so boring that maybe nobody wants to do it with you, which is the reason why Peter said, I go a fishing. But when he said, I go a fishing, what he didn't understand is that there were other people watching him and that said, I'll go fishing with you. And I would believe that Peter probably wanted to go fishing by himself. But these other brothers wanted to say and to accompany him while he was doing that. And he couldn't deny them. He couldn't say, don't come with me because he was still cramped up and, 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 and when you're cramped up you don't care anymore and you're out there in the middle of the water in the middle of the night trying to fish but not being productive and you're floating around in your failure and you have no emotion concerning it you're floating in failure have you ever, even, even in the course of this year, maybe in the course of 2021, maybe certainly in the course of 2020, have you ever floated in failure and you didn't care? 
Uh, your, the mind cramped up so much that you failed and it was like, so what? Have you ever failed a test, failed a quiz, and you were like, so what? It don't matter. Have you ever failed a situation, failed a relationship, and you're like, so what? It don't matter. Your mind has cramped up so bad that you have lost your sensibility to feel any kind of remorse for the failure. Oh, God, have you ever failed so much and, and, and made a mistake so bad that, that you had, there was no sense of, uh, there was a sense of guilt, but the sense of guilt didn't kill you as much as the fact that you just couldn't mentally get yourself together? Your mind cramped up. We know when our minds are cramped up, when you're floating in failure and you have no way of tapping into a success. Floating, the failures of your past. Floating in the mistakes that you've made. Floating in the numbness of grief. Floating in disappointment. Floating in misappropriated expectation. Floating in broken relationships. The kids are crying and you can't respond because your mind is cramped up. People are calling you and you can't respond because your mind has cramped up. People are trying to get a hold to you, but you can't respond because your mind has cramped up. And all you're doing is floating in failure. You start eating yourself out of it. Maybe you go to the store and you pick up that which you know is not good for you, but you eat it anyway. And here you are floating in failure. And you know you're supposed to get out of bed at a certain time, but the covers keep on holding you hostage up underneath it because now if you hold hostage up underneath it, you don't have to deal with the rest of the world the whole day because you find yourself floating in failure and you're okay with it. And maybe somebody is trying to awaken you to the possibility that maybe you need to go and get therapy and go and get counseling or go and get help, but you don't even want the help because you have found a, a familiar place in your failure and you're okay with just floating it. It. Because if you're floating your failure, nobody is going to expect anything from you. And nobody is going to demand anything from you. And nobody is going to expect anything from you. And that would include yourself and everybody is around you looking at the greatness on the inside of you, trying to figure out why are you floating in failure when Jesus was the one that called you to be the rock in the storm. But what do you do when Jesus called you a rock in front of everybody? But that's not the way that you responded when you were in your storm and you have mentally cramped up. I'm in pain and I can't function anymore. Coach, get me out of this game because I can't function anymore and I would prefer to be out the game than for you to do what you need to do in order for me to function so I can continue to play and win this championship and sometimes what you need when you are in that place of mental cramping is a win and the Bible says that it right in the place in which their minds are cramping, that the, that the darkness breaks and the sun starts rising up and light begins to penetrate the darkness, not just of the life, but the darkness that's in the mind. And Peter, while he is in the darkness of his mind, and the disciples, while they're in the environment of Peter's darkness, Here's a voice crying from the shore. Have you children caught anything yet? No, we have not caught anything. And I'm getting comfortable with not catching anything. I'm growing comfortable with not catching anything. I'm growing comfortable with failing. And I, and I need somebody 
to heal me from this mindset. And Jesus says, take your nets and cast them on the right side. Because you had your net on the wrong side, but you didn't know that your net was on the wrong side because your mind has cramped. How is it that you're going to catch fish and be creative enough to switch sides when your mind is so cramped? that it can't even make a simple decision. Uh, why is it that it takes Jesus to come? To tell them that if you're not catching anything on the left, that it makes sense, reasonable sense, to take your net and put it on the right side. Because when you are cramping, even the simplest decisions seems heavy and weighty because your mind is cramped. Oh, God today, I don't know who I'm talking to, but dear God, today is your day of deliverance to get your mind right and to get it healed. Because when your mind is at the place where it's about to break, Jesus comes through in the midst of the breaking and says, cast your net on the other side. Because what you need in order for you to get delivered from this cramped up mind is a win. <laughs> a win. A W-I-N. You need a win. Because the only thing that you have been thinking about are all of your failures and your mistakes and the people that have died and the ones that have gone on and all of it has left you and you're thinking about how you're left floating almost seemingly around people but feeling like you're still by yourself and all you're needing is a win. Just one win. Just one win. Just one win, Lord. Just one win. All I need is one win. Just one win to turn me back on. Just one win. Just one win to activate me. Just one win to get me out of a cramped mind. And divine wins can help you reset your cramped mind. Oh God, I just need one win. I just need one win. I just need one win. And the Bible says that when they cast the net, on that side oh God that they began to carry all this fish oh God 153 to be exact and they were not small fish they were big fish they began to cast and and and, and John says that's Jesus I know him anywhere because only Jesus can get me a win when I'm floating in my failure only Jesus can help me to get out of this only Jesus can give me my next instruction only Jesus can help me and save me from my own cramped up mind from my own cramped up thoughts from my own cramped up morals oh God is the only one that can save me and I hear Jesus talking and the Bible says that when John said, it is Jesus, then uh, Peter put on his clothes and he jumped in the water and he starts swimming ashore because he's been waiting on the wind. But the wind, the wind wasn't about the fish. <laughs> the wind wasn't that about fish. <laughs> he wasn't cramped up in his mind because he couldn't catch fish. He was cramped up in his mind because he needed to have a conversation with Jesus. Because sometimes when you have failed him, the only way that you can make yourself feel better is that you have a conversation with him because all you want to know is whether or not he still loves you. 
Oh, God. Oh, God. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel the Holy Ghost speaking to somebody because sometimes you have made some mistakes and sometimes you have failed and sometimes you have faltered and you haven't doubted all your eyes and neither have you crossed every T. But sometimes the wind is not about you just getting another wind. The wind says something. The wind says God is still for you. The wind says God still loves you. The wind says God still is for you. The wind says God is still cold you. The wind wind says God has still anointed you. The wind says that God is still with you. And that is why you need the wind to get delivered from your cramped up mind. Peter swims to shore. And, and he knows that this conversation is going to heal his mind. Oh God. oh God. I don't know where you are. I don't know where you are, but you are one conversation away from a healed mind. You are one conversation away from God delivering you from a cramped up mind. Oh God, all the creativity that God has in, st in store for you, that God has on the inside of you that you haven't been able to touch all this time because you've been dealing with grief and dealing with remorse and dealing with guilt and, and dealing with all kinds of things. I decree and declare today is your day that God is going to shine a light into your heart and shine a light into your spirit and you are about to come out of that cramped up mind in Jesus' name because because he's about to reset your mind. He's about to reset your focus. He's about to reset your heart. He's about to reset your creativity. Sometimes when you can't function the way that God is calling for you to function, sometimes he's got to turn you off to turn your back on again. Now, now gather everybody around. I need to pray. I need to pray. Dear God, I need to pray. Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, we were trying to to get on Bible study. I do Bible studies from my home. And I was trying to find the live button on Facebook. And I couldn't find it. It was time was fleeting. We were five minutes away, four minutes away from seven o'clock, three minutes away, and two minutes, and one minute away from seven o'clock. And I, I couldn't understand why I could not find. The live button. What, what is wrong with me that I can't find the live button? Am I too anxious that I can't find the live button? The button was here last week. The button was here the, the week before that. Why is it that I can't find the button? Called Kenyana. Kenyana called Cedric and Cedric left a text on my phone and said, you can't find it. Turn the phone off and turn it on again. What? I thought it was something more technical. I, I, I thought it was an issue with the phone. I thought it was an issue with the functionality of the phone. Figure I need to take the phone back. at and and tell them, something's wrong with your phone. I can't find the button. And, and all the phone needed was a reset. <laughs> He said, turn it off, turn it back on, turn it off, turn it back on. Went into the Facebook app. There it is, there it was, the live button. It wasn't there before. It reappeared because all it needed was a reset. All it needed was to be turned off and then turn back on again. Uh, I don't know who I'm talking to, <laughs> but your cramped mind, which you can't think right, you can't think straight, maybe the weight of the world has been on you, your shoulders, maybe the weight of, of educating your own kids all year long and, and not having the benefit of having, having them go off to school, maybe that was a portion of, of the weight and the stress that you've been feeling and dealing with and, 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 and you're stressful 
about whether or not you're going to get COVID or not because you see other people have died from it and, and other people have, have, uh, have, have come out of it, but they came out of it with certain issues as a result of it. And here you are worried about that and you got on the mask and, and you're washing your hands and, and you're doing so much and you're worried about getting it and you're worried about your family getting it and you're worrying about your parents getting it and you're worried about all that stuff. And, and, and to add on to, to all of that, here is the job giving you a furlough or a cut and pay and, and you don't know exactly what's going to happen in your next and, and all of this stuff is happening to you all at the same time and anxiety is starting to fill your heart and, and, and you're starting to cramp up in, in your body and, and your body is malfunctioning in a way that it never malfunctioned before and all of it is happening all at once because your mind is cramped up and here is Jesus coming to you right now because he's about to give you a win He's about to give you a win. He's about to give you a win. He is about to give you a win. Gather the family around. I need to pray. He's about to give you a win because your mind has been broken. But sometimes God comes in the brokenness of our own minds to speak to us. Oh God, the Bible says that when Peter got to the shore and when the rest of the disciples got to the shore, the fish that they were trying to catch to eat didn't matter because Jesus already had fish prepared for them. Oh God, oh God, they already had fish. Here I am trying to work hard to try to prepare something that Jesus has already prepared and I couldn't understand it and I couldn't discern it because my mind was too broken to know that God will provide and God will provide all of the stuff that I need and he is a provider and he's been a provider all this time and the stuff that I've been worried and anxious about he's already provided but I couldn't attach myself to it I couldn't eat it because my mind was cramped So I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel like God is telling you to be like Peter. Jump out of your boat and swim to him. Oh God, courage yourself and swim to him. Oh God, I know you may be cramped up, but being cramped up and being hurt and being delusional and being in pain, whatever, jump out of your boat and swim to him. Because whatever you need, He's already provided. God is able to do just what he said he will do. He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God. Because he won't give up on you. He's able. Fish is prepared. Waiting on you to come and eat. It's already prepared. Your next is already prepared. Waiting on you to come and eat. And Jesus deals with the psychology of what Peter is going through. His coordination has been off. His reasoning has been off. His attention has been off. His memory has been off. His perception has been off. Because God provides. He provides. And the Bible says that Jesus starts to have a conversation with him. Peter, do you love me? Lord, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lamb. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. I'm giving you the next. And then he says, follow me. He talks to him about the death that he's going to have, and he says, follow me. Don't get cramped up or locked up into what's happened. That was a part of the plan. Don't get cramped up and locked up into all the failures and your mistakes. 
You just need one wind to wash over that stuff. I don't hold that against you. Stop holding that against yourself. All I want to know is, do you love me? I know you love me. I know you made some mistakes. I know you denied me three times, but I know you love me, Peter. That's why I'm here. I'm here to confirm the fact that you love me, and I know you love me. I'm just asking you because I need for you to hear you say it. You need to hear yourself say it. I already know. God is able to do just what he said he will do. He's going to fulfill. Get the family around. I need to pray. Every promise to you. Don't you give up on God. Do you love me? Because he won't give up on you. He says, follow me. I'll provide. I'm going to unlock you. I'm going to unlock your mind. I'm going to unlock your creativity. I'm going to unlock your perception. I'm going to unlock your coordination. You'll be able to move the way that I'm calling you to move. Oh, God, you've been stuck. You haven't been able to move the way that you have been preordained to move. I'm, I'm going to unlock your, your, your reasoning, your ability to think in tight spaces. I'm going to unlock your reasoning. Your executive faculties of your brain, of your mind, are about to be unlocked. I'm about to, I'm about to unlock your, your, your attention because you had attention on the wrong stuff. But I'm going to shift your attention on your future now. I'm going to attention. I'm going to, I'm going to give you some, some shifting of your focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to cause to come to your mind, to come to your memory. All the times that I blessed you in times past. Uh, all the times that I provided for everybody else. All the times that you walk with me and you did not go for nothing. You walk with me and you had clothes. You walk with me and you still had food. And you walk with me and I still protected you. And you walk with me and I still provided for you. I am going to release your memory again. But you can perceive right. Because just because it seems like all hell is breaking loose around you, it doesn't mean that that hell needs to be breaking on the inside of you. Oh God, ships don't fall because water is outside of it. Ships fall and sink when the water outside of it gets in it. And he says, I am going to uncramp you. I'm going to bail all the water that's been outside of you. That got in, I'm about to get it out of you. <laughs> I'm about to get that anxiety out of you. I'm about to get that guilt out of you. I'm about to get that pain and that hurt out of you. I'm about to get those, those mistakes of your past out of you. I'm about to get your history out of you. I'm, get, I'm about to get all of it out of you. I'm, I'm coming in because I'm going to uncramp you. Gather the family around. Just what he said he, he will. He's gonna fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God, no matter what. Because he won't give up on you. He's a father. I pray for my brother and my sister. I pray, Father, for them right now. I pray, Father, by the grace that you have given to me. I pray, Father, for the anointing that you have given to me. That minds right now would be uncramped. That minds right now would be unlocked. I pray in the name of Jesus, by your supernatural power, by your providential care, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would release divine coordination back into the lives of your people. Pray, oh God, that you would release, oh God, divine reasoning back into the minds of your people. I pray, oh God, for divine attention to come back into their eyes and their focus and their mindsets. I pray, oh God, that you would release, oh God, a memory to know and to remember that you will provide and that you provide all of the riches and glory, Father, that you do all things well 
I pray, Father, that their memories would be unlocked. And I pray, oh God, that their perception, oh God, would be unlocked and uncramped. That they would be able to perceive on the level that you're calling for them to perceive now their life and their world around them. And I pray, oh God, that in all things that we will continue to follow you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now listen, if you're listening to this and you heard this word and you need prayer, you need to give your life over to the Lord or you want to be baptized, you want to be recommitted to the Lord or whatever. However, whatever is in your heart right now, I want you to go into the Zoom room. We have elders and ministers and deacons right there. We have, we have spiritual counselors there to help you, to walk with you, to pray with you, to pray for you. You're not in it by yourself. You're not in this boat by yourself. We're with you. Come on, let's get uncramped. Let's get uncramped. Come on, let's get that cramp out. Come on, let's get that cramp out. We got to massage it out. We got we to gotta give you some nourishment. We got to give you some water. We got to give you some uh, 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 electrolytes and put it back into your body. There's something that you lost with everything that happened uh, 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 to you all year long, and we want to replenish you. Oh, God, help us. Help, help us to replenish you. All we need for you to do is come into that Zoom room. You want to be baptized? You want to find out more about the church to reconnect and connect? Come on. We're here for you. To walk with you. Everybody else, if you missed the whole given moment and you missed the moment in which we worship the Lord in giving, I want you to give today. Give 77977 and I want you to type in or text TPHFW and be a blessing today because God wants to uncramp can't uncramp you if you're still stingy. There's something that he wants you to release. So release it. All right, family, for the whole month, we're going to be dealing with issues of your mind. Because by the time this month is over, by the time Pentecost comes, by the time the Holy Spirit comes, and he redefines and resets our hearts and our minds and refocuses us for the thing that he has in store for us and for the next leg of life that we've got to run. I decree and declare that you're going to be anointed, empowered, blessed, that grace of God is going to abound in you, that you're going to see yourself in a way that you've never seen yourself, that everything and everybody around you is going to be blessed because of your obedience and as you follow Christ, that things are going to open up to you. Red seas are going to open up. Manna will fall from heaven. Dear God today. I feel the anointing of God. Yes, I heard the bell. Yes, yes, things are going to happen and shift for you. You'll see the fire of God leading you in the nighttime and the cloud leading you in the daytime. You're going to see God's leading and his dispensation over your life. I decree and declare that this is a turning month. Can I remind you that this is the fifth month and it is the month of grace? So I say to you, grace be multiplied to you. Till we meet again, till I see you again. Peace. Wow, qué tremendo mensaje. Ha tocado mi vida y espero que haya tocado la tuya también. Si sientes que esta palabra habló a tu vida, te invitamos a que entres con nuestros ministros al a Zoom. Aquí abajo está el link para que puedan orar por ti, para que puedas aceptar a Cristo como tu Salvador. Recuerda que después del servicio a la una de la tarde, Pastor Patrick Winfield te va a esperar en Clubhouse. Y no olvides marcar en tu calendario el miércoles a las 7 p.m. para Estudio Bíblico. What an amazing word by Pastor Winfield. Such an amazing minister to each and every one of us. And we pray that it ministered to you as well. Listen, uh, our elders and ministers are still on Zoom waiting for you. Maybe you're feeling a tug at your heart. Listen, the Zoom information is down below. Copy that. Go to that site because they're there to lead you to Christ, to pray with you. Uh, and, and listen, do not forget at 1 p.m., Patrick Winfield will be on Clubhouse. So join us there. And don't forget, mark on your calendars Wednesday night at 7 p.m., family, for Bible study. So important. So please join us. And thank you for joining us today. We love you guys. And have an amazing week. God bless you. Cinco de Mayo. Felicidades. Even though we're in a digital space, we're still doing ministry. That's right, Elder Topaz, we are. It's amazing to see our church carry out the Great Commission by making disciples of all nations. 
through our mobile food pantry, our virtual app sessions, our community initiatives, our volunteers, our online services, and so much more. Yes, Elder Topaz, it has been incredible. If you are interested in becoming a part of our ministry, we have some amazing ways on how you can become a member. You can attend our Foundations class every second Saturday of the month at 12 p.m. In addition, you can attend our Place class every fourth Saturday of the month at the same time. Our Foundation class gives you an understanding of how our ministry was formed. Our PLACE class intentionally helps you identify your purpose and which areas of ministry are best suited for you as a volunteer. Now you're probably wondering and sitting at home thinking out loud, Elder Topaz, how can I register? To do so, visit our website at tphfw.org backslash members and register for our online classes and workshops. Once you're on the website, click the membership graphic as seen on the screen to register. We are excited to have you join our ministry. Yes, we are. We hope you have a blessed day.